Plato's Cave is produced by Muckraker Media. You can find out more at muckrakermedia.org. Welcome to Plato's Cave. I'm Jordan Myers, and today we're going to take another step towards exiting the cave by speaking with the philosopher Bernardo Castrup. Bernardo has a PhD in philosophy, focusing on ontology and philosophy of mind, and another PhD in computer engineering, uh, where he focused on reconfigurable computing and artificial intelligence. As a scientist, Bernardo has worked for the European Organization for Nuclear Research, or CERN, and the Philips Research Laboratories. And today we spoke about many very interesting things. Uh, this was a this was a really really intense but very interesting conversation. We spoke about uh, the philosophical notion of idealism, how that influences uh, views on consciousness, what matter or material is actually made of, uh, critiques of panpsychism, and tackling different concerns about experience. This was an amazing dive into the philosophy of mind. Uh, that topic of philosophy. So without further introduction, I bring you my conversation with Bernardo Castrup. So I guess um, to begin first, thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to do this. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad you invited me. So you have um, two PhDs, one in philosophy and one in computer engineering. Um, yeah. Were those both from the same university and which one came first? Uh, computer engineering came first. They are not both from the same university. <laughs> uh, the, the university is close by. Uh, uh, the Netherlands has uh, three heavyweight technical universities and six general universities, which include the humanities. Okay. So I have one PhD from one of the three technical universities, um, arguably the best, <laughs> and the other one from, from one of the six traditional uh, okay. uh, universities. Argue, oh, not arguably. Last year, it was the best university uh, of the six, <laughs> according to the rankings, but they can change year to year. Sure, sure. Well, all that matters is that the year that you went, it was. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so if, I'm, if my research is correct, you're currently at Radbound University. Is that right? Uh, I, I don't work for the university. Okay. <clears throat> I used to work until a very short time ago, until end of June, um, in the high-tech sector. I did a high-tech corporate strategy for a number of years. Uh, philosophy was not my, my, my day job. Mm. Um, I have uh, left that life now. I have left my, my life as a, as a high technology strategist. Um, and I'm focusing now on starting up a new foundation uh, whose aim is to promote uh, metaphysical idealism as a rational, empirically grounded uh, option for our metaphysical issues. Uh, mm. I'm convinced it is the best story we have available today. So I'm now full time on that. I have never been an academic. I have two PhDs, but I have never worked uh, for academia. That's interesting. Did you go into the PhDs knowing that you didn't want to go back into academia? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, yeah, I did, I'm, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I, I when I did my first PhD, um, I did it in parallel to to a job as a, as a researcher. Mm. Uh, so I was already in the private sector. I, I already had left CERN in Switzerland, which was a public organization, and I was already doing res scientific research, but for the private sector. And I got my PhD in parallel with that because I could use, say, fifty percent of Sorry, there is an <laughs> idiot who lives here up the road That's and okay. likes to do this now and then. And my windows are open because of the heat. Um, my company allowed, uh, allowed me to use uh, half my uh, uh, research uh, in, a, in a public thesis, so that helped. And the second PhD was also something I did in parallel to, to working. So I, I, I never even had the chance to think about <laughs> working for for academia because I I was already employed uh, mm. when I did both my PhDs. Yeah, that's just really interesting to hear that you did uh, the engineering uh, degree first and then philosophy because I have an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering and I want to return um, to philosophy and get a PhD, but but with the explicit aim to to teach and return to academia after that. Um, so I was just interested to hear your story there. 
yeah, I, but I was never tempted to go to academia, to be honest with you. Mm. I, I prize my freedom, even when I work <laughs> for the private sector, which I did yeah. for well over 20 years. Uh, nobody in the private sector cares what my metaphysical views are. Sure. So long as uh, <laughs> I make money for, you know, come up with good products and make money for the company. Sure. So I, I prize that intellectual independence. I have always prized it. And mm. uh, I'm not saying that in academia you don't have intellectual independence. I think the reason you go to academia might be even for that reason. Mm. Uh, but I've seen enough going on that I thought, you know what, I... I, I don't need that, and I don't want that. I'm, I'm preserve my independence. Fair enough. So I want to get into um, your your ideas about idealism with you, um, because I think that if I understand um, your works correctly, is sort of the basis for your views on consciousness as well, right? Well, uh, yeah. It, 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 these two things are actually one: consciousness and idealism. True. Idealism is the metaphysical view that the ground of all reality is phenomenal consciousness, not your phenomenal consciousness, consciousness alone, not my alone, but a, a transpersonal view of uh, experiential states or phenomenal states. That, that that's the position of idealism. And then, if that is the case, if phenomenal consciousness is that to which you reduce everything else, is that in terms of which you explain everything else, then my theory of consciousness is that consciousness is first. I don't need to explain it because it's that thing in terms of which I explain everything else. Mm. And that's not a disadvantage. Any theory of nature has to stop at some point and say, okay, this is given. I will explain everything else in terms of it, but this is given. Well, my given is consciousness. Therefore, I don't need to explain it. And this is legitimate as long as I succeed in explaining everything else in terms of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to ask you is, um, you know, in conversations with, you know, um, friends of mine who have more of a materialist leaning, they will accuse, you know, any, any sympathy with that sort of a view as, well, you're just taking it as an axiom uh, that, you know, that the uh, mental phenomenon is the, the base substance of reality. Um, and so, you know, obviously what you said is relevant because, well, they're just taking it as the assumption that it's not. Now, is, do you see, I mean, is there anything that we might do to sort of grant credence to either idea besides maybe something like logical consistency? Because presumably there's no evidence for either view, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would argue <laughs> there is a, a embarrassingly strong evidence from two completely different fields of human knowledge, neuroscience okay. and foundations of physics. But uh, I, I like the way we structure the question because motivation number one is even if no evidence could discriminate between metaphysical materialism and metaphysical idealism, even in the absence of any empirical discrimination, any empirical basis for discriminating between the two, uh, I think idealism would still win hands down because it's more parsimonious, you postulate less ontological categories, it's mm. certainly internally consistent, um, it wins on all the values. I mean, it's the ultimate in reductionism because you reduce everything to one entity. Can you do that? If you, if you succeed in doing that, it, it, it's a big thing. Uh, uh, it's naturalist, because nobody is saying that there is a metacognitive god that decides how the world will go on. We are just saying that it's nature, right? Nature behaving according to certain patterns of regularities. It's just that from the first person perspective, there is something it is like to be nature. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so I, I think we would still have a strong case. But as it happens, foundations of physics today, unless you believe in that ridiculous ridiculous fairy tale that uh, at every fraction of a second there are gazillion universes popping into existence in which everything that can happen actually happens somewhere in this mushrooming gazillion of universes. Mm -hmm. Unless you believe that, um, experimentally we have refuted physical realism. Uh, yes, there is a world out there in which we are all immersed, obviously, but whatever that world is, it, it is not constituted by defined physical entities that we can describe with defined quantities like mass, charge, position, momentum. Whatever it is, it is not physical in that regard. We've defeated physical realism now in the field of foundations of physics, uh, quantum physics. Uh, um, and that's why so many people are now saying, well, there are gazillion universes popping up into existence every plank time. Mm -hmm. I mean, if anything defeats and defies and contradicts uh, Occam's razor, it got to 
got to be this, right? You cannot think of anything more unlikely than this. Uh, so people are taking that up because they prefer it due to cultural prejudice and, mm. and habit. They prefer that to the alternative, which is, yes, there is a world out there, but it's not physical. It is mental. And physicality emerges on the screen of perception once our individual minds interact with that transpersonal mentality out there. This interaction is what we call measurement. And measurement is what brings physicality, objects with defined physical properties, into existence. Mm. So that's foundation of, of foundations of physics. There is also neuroscience. Sure. But just a, a couple questions about that. What, what, um, what, what do you kind of think about the response to that that someone might have that says, um, just trying to formulate the words here, you know, it, if if you have to postulate that, you know, there's only sort of, you know, one reality, say, like there's not, like you said, um, these infinite number of infinitely expanding universes that are popping up into existence, right? Physical universes. Physical universes, sure. What about, you know, the sort of question of, well, you know, where is all of this mental activity happening, right? Like, where is it sort of... Because I, I, I can I, I do understand that intuition to sort of question it on that basis, right? Like if all this is happening, sort of where is it happening almost? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a cultural knee-jerk reaction. We are so used culturally to thinking about mind in terms of a derivative secondary phenomenon mm. that exists in something else or that is produced by something else. That when somebody like me comes up and says, you know what? Uh, 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 reality out there are transpersonal experiential states. And then we start asking, well, but uh, what generates those transpersonal experiential states? Where does yeah. that mind exist? Uh, that's the point. It, it doesn't exist anywhere. It's that wherein everything else exists. Mm. You cannot keep on keep on telling, well, this exists in that and that exists in that other thing. You cannot keep on doing that forever. At some point, you hit rock bottom. Whatever your metaphysical position is, you, you will hit rock bottom at some point. You might say, well, uh, it all happens within the space-time framework, the space-time scaffolding, and it's objective and it's really out there. Well, that theory is, is uh, you know, out the window. We know space-time is not. A, a space and time together certainly are fundamental. They are not the vessel wherein everything else happens. We know that's not the case. Uh, but when we say mind is that vessel, and therefore the vessel is not within any other vessel. vessel. It's not turtles all the way down, you know. Mm. You have to stop somewhere. And where I stop is transpersonal mind. That's the, the framework, that's the field wherein everything else exists, where everything else and where from everything else is generated. Mm -hmm. Now, do you do you see that as more parsimonious than a position like panpsychism, for instance? Because at the core of your, you know, sort of your assumption is that there is just one um, substance, and it's and it's pure mental, uh, or pure mentality. Whereas it seems like you're sort of postulating two different, or at least two maybe conjoined concepts with panpsychism, where there's material, but then there's a quality to that material that is fundamental, that is experiential or consciousness. Yeah. Is, that, is that an accurate assessment? Yeah, I think that's an accurate assessment, but I think panpsychism is, is, is incoherent. Before I go into the incoherence uh, part, notice that um, what motivates the panpsychism to say that uh, in addition to fundamental mind or experiential states, there are also fundamental physical properties. Uh, what motivates the panpsychist to do that is that when we look around, we see a world that can be accurately described through physical properties. I can attach a number, mass, I can attach another number, size, another number, uh, momentum, to things to describe them quite accurately. And we have been very successful at describing things in numerical or quantitative terms. Um, so successful that now we think that the description has its own reality. That the description mm. precedes that which is described. Because what is described is mental. Uh, the screen of perception is mental. What I see is, is a content of my consciousness. The colors I see, the flavors I taste, these are all experiential states. We describe these experiential states in a way that's mutually consistent across observers through numbers 
through quantities. Um, and, and, and then we forget that it's just a description. And we, we reify it and we say it has a standalone existence. The description precedes that which it describes. That's what motivates the panpsychist to say, well, in addition to consciousness, there is also this stuff, this description, and it has a standalone existence. So I, there is no, in other words, there is no true motivation to do that. Now, if you, if you grant this to the panpsychist and say, okay, I'll forget this and I'll pretend that, uh, that you have a legitimate basis for postulating a second thing, um, panpsychism is incoherent because it assumes that um, the physical world is fundamentally divided into separate little parts that we call elementary subatomic particles. And we do in physics talk all the time about elementary subatomic particles. What the panpsychist fails to understand is that this is a metaphor. It's just a way of speaking. Uh, since you know quantum electrodynamics and the broader quantum field theory that began uh, with Feynman and all the other guys, we know that what we call uh, elementary particles are just localized patterns of excitation of a spatially unbound underlying field, a quantum field. And we think there are many of these quantum fields, uh, one for each type of elementary subatomic particle, uh, but they are all spatially unbound. They, they You cannot localize them in space. Uh, uh, a particle is to the quantum field like a ripple is to water. You can point at the ripple and you can say it has this height, it has this breadth, it has this speed, it goes in this direction. You can characterize the ripple in terms of physical quantities, but there is nothing to the ripple but the lake where it's rippling. If you remove the lake, there is no ripple. You can't take the ripple out of the lake. There is just the lake. In the same way, there is just a quantum field. There are no such things as particles. It's just shorthand for talking about a ripple moving in the quantum field. And the panpsychist, however, assumes that this ripple actually has a standalone existence. It, it is spatially bound. It's not. The quantum field is not spatially bound. So if you want to attribute consciousness to a fundamental physical entity, you have to do that to the field because it's the only thing that exists. Just in the same way that it's only the lake that exists. The ripple is just a movement, a pattern of excitation of the lake. And if the panpsychist does that, the panpsychist cannot explain why we have individuated consciousness because he's attributing consciousness to the whole field. It's just that it makes, I, I honestly think that makes a lot of sense, but it is for some reason intuitively so strange to, to really consider that. And it must be, I mean, I guess it really must be the fact that we are so, um, we're so used to sort of attributing, like you said, you know, properties to things um, that are sort of ex, you know, external to ourselves and extrinsic and, and, and objective and it's just very it's it's such a strange notion to consider that um but it's very difficult to even examine let yeah. alone overcome one's um, habitual uh, uh, assumptions mm. that we inherit from culture one yeah. of them is mind is derivative the other one is the description has a standalone existence therefore matter uh, precedes uh, that which it describes mm. i mean there are so if you pay attention to how many of these unexamined assumptions we are making all the time uh, it's horrifying it's it's very very strange and and unsettling honestly for a lot of people i think what do you so so what do you take as sort of the um i'm a, i'm kind of i'm trying to put myself in the framework of of a materialist who wants to object to this and and what would you say to the objection that well you know since things are so observable and describable in in repeating you know patterns right we have laws of nature for instance I could see people imagining that that gives evidence for something like materialism where you know no matter what we think of something. Um, it's going to behave in the way that it's going to, independently of us. And that I could see people assuming that if idealism is true, then there's no rational basis to believe there's any consistency to matter. It's because we are anthropomorphizing uh, mm. idealism. We are, we are implicitly, one of those unexamined assumptions, mm. we are implicitly, ass implicitly assuming that whenever we say it's mental, then it's like human mentality, and that's not at all what it said. What it said is that ontologically, the category of that existent is mental. It's the same category of my own mentality. But the behavior of my mentality has evolved on ecosystems on planet Earth over 
millions of years, and it has led to a uh, an unpredictable mind that reacts to its environment because it needs to survive. Uh, it can be highly emotional because, you know, emotions lead to action a lot quicker than uh, rational thinking, which is a layer of our thinking that evolved much later uh, in, in our evolutionary history. And then we take all these attributes and properties and characteristics that evolved in the monkey, uh, that monkey that uh, evolved on planet Earth, <laughs> and we say, well, this must be intrinsic to all possibilities when it comes to something mental. Uh, it's not. It's just us. We think like that. We are unpredictable. We are mm. emotional. Um, crocodiles are not. Crocodiles are very highly predictable. Uh, you can predict exactly at what distance you need to be from them before they might react. Uh, you can predict exactly when they will leave the, the sun and go back to the shade. Uh, and they, they are very predictable animals because their mind operates instinctively. Many insects uh, operate in very predictable ways. We have um, artificial, artificial intelligence algorithms today that emulate what ant colonies uh, do, emulate their behavior. Mm. And, and it's very useful to solve complicated problems. It turns out ant colonies and, and other insect colonies are very intelligent. But it also reflects exactly their behavior. Uh, when it comes to lower instinctive animals, closer to the undifferentiated level of mind, uh, things unfold uh, quite predictably, uh, instinctively, uh, not in a premeditated thought through or emotional way. Mm. That's why many people think that insects are like robots. <laughs> why, why do you think there is this intuition? It's because they behave robotically according <laughs> to certain patterns of behavior that are stable and predictable. Now, transpersonal mental states, mind at large, is even a lot more predictable with the insects because they didn't evolve at all in an in, in, it didn't evolve at all in an ecosystem. It is that within which everything has evolved. Mm. Uh, it has had no reason to evolve the reactive patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving that we have evolved. It does what it does because it is what it is, and it <laughs> cannot be any, any any different than what it is. So how do you see the connection then between the sort of transpersonal mind, the mind at large, as you called it, and then individual sort of localizations of mind? What, what is the, what's the connection there? There is a well-known phenomenon in psychiatry called uh, dissociation. Uh, for, it has been known for many decades, at least since the second half of the 19th century. Um, until fairly recently, there was still some surviving polemic about it. People would say, you know, uh, uh, these patients of extreme forms of dissociation that say they have multiple personalities that, you know, fight against each other for control of the body or for behaving in a certain way, they are lying. Uh, they want attention. They are attention seekers. Uh, there was questions like this until late in the 20th century, arguably until the first decade of the 21st century. But over the past 10 years, now we have neuroimaging. You know, people can't fake certain things when it comes to patterns of brain activity that can be objectively measured. And we know that uh, strong forms of dissociation do occur and they do lead to co-consciousness, dissociated outer personalities within a single mind uh, that become disjoint from one another. So we know that something like strong dissociation occurs in mental space because it occurs in humans. Uh, uh, you can even talk to a former patient of dissociative identity disorder, and, uh, and it's fantastic how they describe uh, what it is like to be reintegrated and to remember the memories of each of those dissociated authors as your own and to realize that actually it was you doing all of that all along. Um, wow. it, you know, any, any person, even without a hint of dissociation, undergoes a dissociative experience when we dream. When we have an ordinary dream, we identify with our dream avatar. Mm but we think that we are separate and different from that part of our mind that is generating the rest of the dream. Mm. Uh, we think it's outside us. You know, all those cars and buildings and trees and people walking around, they are not me. Only when you wake up, you realize, hey, it was me all along. I was doing everything. I was doing the avatar. I was doing the yeah. cars. I was doing, I was doing <laughs> the trees. And I was doing everything. But during the dream, we are dissociated from ourselves. So everybody has an intuition about what dissociation is and what it feels like to emerge from dissociation and realize it was you all along. Um, my argument is something analogous to this happens at a universal level. 
And this one universal field of mentation that I like to reduce everything else to, because I'm an extreme reductionist, undergoes a dissociation-like process. And life is what these dissociative processes look like when observed from across a dissociative boundary. You know, when you put a person with dissociative identity disorder uh, uh, in an fMRI, fMRI scanner, the dissociative processes look like something. You can see them mm. on the brain scanner. There is something they look like from the outside. My point is that what dissociation at a universal level looks like is life. It's biology. Living beings are what dissociative alters of universal consciousness look like from across their dissociative boundary. As a matter of fact, matter is what uh, uh, experiential states across a dissociative boundary look like. It's the name we give it. We call it matter. <laughs> because we have evolved to acquire information about the world beyond our dissociative boundary in a very compact and coded form um, that would favor survival as opposed to truth. And that's why the endogenous experiential states out there, or in other people, uh, look to us like what we call matter. You know, atoms and force fields that uh, mm. behave in certain ways. So I guess that would be, that would be your response to, to answering, you know, a question sort of like, well, if we're all, um, you know, aspects of one, one you know, uh, mind at large, then why would we ever have different experiences? Um, and it would be, you know, due to that, we're, you know, different parts of one whole, almost, you know, it's a, it's a loose analogy. Yeah, if you are dissociated, you have different experiences. There is, um, mm -hmm. there is research uh, done, was it Harvard or Princeton? Well, my, anyway, if you, if you look at my website, you will find it somewhere. Um, they studied the dreams of uh, patients of extreme forms of dissociation dissociative identity disorder, mm -hmm. which is very nice because then you know that all the experiences are endogenous. They have nothing to do with an outside world. The dreams of dissociative patients are uh, encapsulated mental worlds. And um, it turns out, and this is consistently observed, different dissociated personalities of the person experience the same dream from different points of view. And they can even see each other within the dream. So when they wake up, depending on which alter is talking to the therapist, the dream will be narrated from a different perspective. Wow. Uh, um, so we know that dissociated alters have different experiences in endogenous mental space. And that's, that's all we need to say that the hypothesis I'm raising is not only plausible, there are instances of it in nature. I, I was about to say that I can't even imagine what that experience would be like, but... To be honest, I, I it's probably just a tuned up version of the experience of having different moods, right? Like, I mean, I'm sure we've all done something, you know, in in like, you know, there's that saying, you know, you you see red and you kind of do something in in rage that afterwards you almost look at it like it was done by a different person. You're like, I can't believe I did that or said that thing, and I would imagine it's kind of it's very similar to that, but just tuned up a bit. Uh, it's much more drastic than that, I sure, think. But, sure. but that that does provide uh, a hint. Or when you suddenly realize that uh, you have known something or you have felt in a certain way all along, you were just not explicitly aware of it. Yeah. When you realize, for instance, that, uh, oh, I have had pain on my knee all day today, but you were not explicitly aware of it. But in hindsight, you know you were having, you were just dissociated from it. Mm -hmm. um, um, there are more, I mean, there, there are simple exercises we can do. I mean, right now, you are experiencing the world uh, through two parallel co-conscious points of view. They are called your left and your right eye. Mm. Uh, but if things are far enough, uh, uh, your mind will merge these points of, points of view and they will look like one. But if you put your finger in front of your nose and you close one eye and open the other and you alternate, you see very clearly that each what each eye sees of your finger uh, is not available to the other. So there you have, you have two disjoint points of view into experience in the same mind. The only thing is they are not dissociated. What happens in this association is that... Uh, 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 the mind of the dissociative patient doesn't try to merge these two experiences. They remain oh. separate. No, that's, you, yeah, that's yeah. honestly, that is crazy. And I guess, so obviously that's the analog, uh, analogy to the different parts. It, you know, it would be like if the sort of, you know, eyes dissociated, 
but obviously they're stemming from the same underlying uh you know entity that they're splitting from and that would be analogous to the same way that we each have our own experiences per se but but it's resulting from that's crazy honestly that, <laughs> but it makes but it makes sense it's a very natural thing that is happening all the time it's just that our cultural momentum is such that we don't validate it and what we don't validate and encode in language we, we don't perceive yeah. it escapes our explicit awareness that's the power of culture and uh, it's not like you don't experience this you, you are experiencing dissociation throughout your life um, but it, it doesn't become explicitly recognized because of the cultural narratives we inherit mm -hmm. it's amazing what uh, what uh, beliefs unexamined assumptions and cultural narratives can do for our sense of reality. It's astounding. And it's, it seems to be answering the sort of the converse um, question, because, you know, obviously the, um, the, the biggest question that panpsychism brings up is the combination problem. You know, how could individual um, points of consciousness amalgamate to form a universal? And this is, and this is obviously looking at that same problem from the reverse. How could a universal uh, consciousness dissociate into individual instances of it. So yeah. I'm curious because, and honestly, I mean, your arguments have been very convincing, but because you, um, you know, believe that the, the dissociation problem is not a problem, why then is the combination problem such a big problem? Uh, arguably, it's, it's even incoherent, and there have been many who have made this argument. There is a paper I like very much by Sam Coleman, 2014 paper in which he basically says no forget plausibility is this idea even coherent to begin with does it make sense to say that fundamentally distinct subjectivities can merge and form a unified derivative higher level subjectivity and he proceeds to show that it's incoherent that you can state this in language but it makes no sense whatsoever um, it, it's it's a long I'm not sure I should even start trying to explain what the argument is sure um, but you know there, there are many uh, gateways uh, to make a certain theory believable the first one is is it even coherent does it make any logical sense? If you are through that gate, then the next gate is, is it plausible? Mm. Is it plausible to think that it happens? If you are through that gate, then the next point is, have we actually found it happening? Now, even if it is plausible, have we, have we observed it? That's the third gate. Mm. Um, dissociation uh, is immediately through the third gate. You don't even need to think about the first two gates. Uh, is it coherent? Well, guess what? It, it is. Is it plausible? It is. But it doesn't matter because we observe it. It's out there. It's a phenomenon of the world. And mm. neuroimaging has shown that uh, it's for real. I mean, uh, there are things like there is this. there was this woman in Germany uh, studied on in 2015 um, she had many dissociated alters, a couple of them claimed to be blind, and the others were sight capable. So the psychiatrists thought, you know what, let's hook her up to, I, I don't remember whether it was an MEG or an EEG. EEG um, maybe? Okay. I, I think maybe it was an EEG, something that reads brain activity. Okay. And has very good temporal uh, resolution. Mm. It is important in these cases because, you know, the alter may disappear, another alter may pop into control. So you need to have good temporal resolution. Mm. Um, and uh, guess what? When a sighted alter was in control, they measured the activity in the visual cortex at the back of the brain of the woman. And it was normal visual activity. When an uh, alter was in control that claimed to be blind, uh, the visual cortex would turn off and there was no activity there, even though the woman's <laughs> eyes were open. And this kind of thing you can't fake. Dissociation happens and it is literally blinding. Not metaphorically wow. only, it's also literally wow. blinding. Um, so uh, th this puts the idea of uh, the de decomposition problem, how one mind becomes many, uh, on a much, much stronger footing than the alternative idea, how many fundamentally distinct minds become one. Um, because that, that is even incoherent. Forget plausibility, forget observ empirical observation. It, it's incoherent. It doesn't make sense uh, to say that. Um, so, yeah, I don't think the problem is symmetrical at all. That's <laughs> honestly, I, you're like blowing my mind right now because I would have never, 
you know, I started looking into this a couple weeks ago, and um, and that's how I obviously like came into contact with you. But I would have never given idealism honestly a chance for a second. But because it's just, I mean, I I thought I had really good reason, and I'm not sure if someone you know asks me tomorrow, what exactly do you believe ontologically? I'm not a hundred percent sure either way. But it, it there really is. I mean, I guess a lot of people read Kant on his transcendental idealism, and it doesn't seem very plausible because maybe he doesn't, you know, obviously he was writing centuries ago, and he doesn't, you know, put forth maybe the best argument styles for it, but what what you've been going over is honestly far more convincing. Uh, you know, you shouldn't feel guilty about it because the power of culture is, is g just gigantic. We are indoctrinated without knowing from the moment we speak our first word and can understand what's spoken to us. Mm. Um, but uh, our current mainstream metaphysics, materialism, has two enormous things going for it. One is momentum. It's pure momentum, habit. It, it you know, it's, it's an echo chamber of materialism. Most materialists uh, don't come at the conclusion that materialism is correct. They just absorb it. They don't reason it through, they just absorb it. it, it it's a given. Mm. Uh, it's uh, uh, osmosis, <laughs> cultural yeah. osmosis. Yeah. And the other big thing that materialists have going, that materialism has going for it, is that what people believe in and call materialism is not materialism at all, but people don't know it. In other words, what materialism has going for it is that most materialists don't understand what materialism is. Um, uh, let's not keep this theoretical. Let's mention a concrete example. Okay. Um, there is this uh, militant uh, materialist, uh, professor of biology, Jerry Coyne. Okay. Uh, he's a very colorful figure. Uh, it's, uh, it's very entertaining. I, 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 uh, yeah. I enjoy interacting with him. And of course, he tries to hammer me every single time. This is going on <laughs> now for a couple of years. Um, and uh, the, not long ago, uh, uh, Jerry Coyne um, was arguing that um, all life, even bacteria, have experiences. Of course. Uh, and he talked about uh, microscopic crustaceans. Uh, having experiences, but he goes all the way down to bacteria and says, whatever uh, uh, a form of life, even unicellular life, um, uh, registers internally is qualia, is experience, is a quality. Mm -hmm. And and I was amazed when he used that as part of his argument against my idealism, because my ideal, idealism says precisely that sure. life is what dissociated. Uh, 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 conscious activity looks like. So if you want to attribute individual uh, consciousness or private conscious inner life to anything, you should attribute it only to living beings, not to anything else. So Koino is agreeing with me, and it's amazing he didn't <laughs> notice that he was contradicting materialism, because what materialism says is that you need a relatively sophisticated nervous system to give rise to consciousness. Yeah. And therefore... Uh, it doesn't happen in unicellular organisms or, or, or Daphnia, microscopic crustacea. I mean, these things mm. don't have a nervous system. Um, materialism says that consciousness is an emergent property of fairly complex material organizations that we call nervous mm. systems. Um, but he was clueless that he was contradicting materialism. And I, I thought that was enormously entertaining and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and and um, informational, so to say. Yeah. Uh, most materialists would say what's out there has color, has sound, has flavor. The world beyond me has colors. Well, guess what? Materialism says that that's not the case. The world beyond you has no colors, has no melodies, has no flavors, has no textures, has nothing that, that, that can be described as a quality. Um, all those qualities, all the colors you see, the world you see around you, they are all being generated inside your skull. The inner surface of your real skull is beyond the stars you see in the night sky, because the stars you see are qualities. They are generated by your brain inside your skull. Now, if people really understand that this is what materialism is saying, materialism is saying the world that you have ever experienced in your life is unfolding entirely inside your head. What is really up there is completely abstract. 
the best you can say is that it's a set of mathematical equations, but it has no qualities. If people understood this, they would go like, oh, am I really a materialist? <laughs> uh, because it is idealism that says the world of qualities you see out there mm. is really out there. Mm. Those qualities, there are qualities out there, really. It is idealism that is intuitive, but our culture has managed to steal and swap these things. What people <laughs> understand as materialism today and think plausible is actually idealism. If they understood materialism, they would go like, this is nuts. These people are saying that it's all happening inside my head. Of course it's not. Yes, it's not. <laughs> and yes, every living creature is conscious in and of itself. Yes, Jerry Coyne is correct. Yeah. It's just that he is a he is a closet idealist. He doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that 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 makes sense of the other problem that materialists encounter, where if they say, well, you know, it has to be. We know the number of of you know interactive neural components has to be more than one, because otherwise you're a panpsychist, right? So if yeah. it's more than one, why? why i don't understand what the basis would be for saying there's like a cutoff point like it, it, what what's the difference then between saying consciousness arises at 598 neurons instead of 599 i don't see a principled basis of for course that. not it's absurd right and it is absurd that there is all there is to it having said that i can i can help people understand understand why we've come to this absurdity why we've come to think that this is plausible and the reason is the following there is nothing about um, the parameters we call matter, mass, charge, momentum, frequency, amplitude. There's nothing about any of these things in terms of which we could deduce what it feels like to have a bellyache, to fall in love, to see red, to taste strawberries. Um, and of course there isn't, because we've defined matter in such a way as to exclude all qualities. So of course we can't deduce qualities from matter, because we defined it so as to exclude it. That's, mm. we, we replaced reality with our description of reality, and we started believing that the description preceded that which it describes. Now, mm. that's absurd, but that, that's, how we, that's how we ended up. Now, since we can't deduce any experience from any material arrangement, the only thing we can do is to hide the problem behind complexity. Because we have no clue, not even in principle, how this might work, we just say, well, if things get complicated enough, then somehow, in a way that I don't understand, magic happens and consciousness pops. Mm. Uh, that, this is literally what has happened. We do not understand how the brain or any material arrangement for that matter can possibly give rise to the qualities of experience. That's the hard problem of consciousness. Sure. Uh, so we just say, well, we don't understand it because the brain, so, the brain is so complex that we don't understand what it does. But mm. one day we will understand it. And this day never comes <laughs> because this is just an artifact of bad thinking. But in order to save an untenable metaphysics, we hide its obvious untenable problem behind a promissory note and uh, complexity. Mm. That's what we do. Now, because if you slice a Daphnia crustacean, you can count the number of cells that are participating uh, in its uh, perceptual apparatus. You can't say that consciousness emerges from that. It's not complex enough. You can't hide the problem. There's no space to hide the problem. So you say, unlike what uh, Jerry Coyne maintains, Daphnia crustaceans are not conscious. Mm. But the human brain is so darn complicated, and so are elephant brains and dolphin brains and gorilla brains, that something, some magic is happening there that we don't understand. It's hidden behind that complexity, and therefore materialism is still plausible. That's mm. the level of, forgive me my English, the level of bullshit uh, uh, in our culture today, even and perhaps foremost in academia. Mm. And I guess it would, I guess it would really make sense. I'm sure maybe a lot of listeners are familiar with the, um, the Mary the color scientist thought experiment, where if you take, um, you know, a child, uh, and from birth, you sort of keep her in this black and white room. And, you know, m you alter her skin color to just be purely in black and white, right? Like, there's no, there's no, well, I guess there There's are colors. Version. You can say Mary sure. uh, was born colorblind. Oh, there are people it. who that's are born it. colorblind. Yep. So you can just yep. do that. 
Sure. So Mary is born colorblind. And, you know, so for her whole for for her whole life, she never sees the color red, but she becomes a, you know, a, um, a neuroscientist and a biologist and a and a expert on color and the material correlates of color. Um, and then the, so the question is that according to, you know, if she learns everything there is to know about the color red, the, the neuroscience of seeing the color red, the biology of seeing the color red, everything we could possibly imagine. Physics of the color red. Exactly, exactly. That that she would know everything about, you know, the color and presumably know what it looks like. But if we cured her color blindness and, you know, she sees the color red for the first time, there is undoubtedly going to be some piece of knowledge, some experiential knowledge gained of what the color red actually looks like and actually is. And that seems to be a reductio ad absurdum of uh, the materialist framework, because on their account, she wouldn't be learning anything because there's nothing else to know, right? Yeah, amazingly enough, there are people out there that maintain with a straight face that no, there would be nothing new Mary would learn about the color red the moment she actually saw the color red. That everything else she already knew, what the frequency is of the electromagnetic field that corresponds to the color red, how it's processed by your retina, your, your visual nerve and your visual cortex, all of that would somehow convey to Mary all knowledge there is to have about what it is mm. like to actually see the color red. There are people who defend this point of view with a straight face. There are philosophers who are paid by public money and more than that who achieved even a degree of uh, of fame and respect that maintain the most absurd views conceivable to the human mind including this one that uh, that there is nothing to consciousness but quantitative descriptions or that consciousness is an illusion which Im immediately raises the question or who is having the illusion aren't you consciously having the illusion mm. um, people who these, these are eliminativists and illusionists as they call themselves yeah. Yeah. Uh, they maintain the most absurd positions that can be maintained by that can be conceived by human thought uh, but they hide it in in impenetrable uh, networks of abstraction uh, so as to maintain the appearance that that it's you who is not quite getting what they mean <laughs> you know what i mean i and, do and, i do and, yeah. entire careers have been built on top of complete nonsense uh, based on this on this this idea that they are very smart people and it's you who are actually not because it's so absurd what they are saying that you cannot accept that it's just that it's just absurd mm. you can't accept it you think no there's something i'm missing here there is some subtle philosophical twist of mind that i'm missing here and these guys must must be geniuses no they are not geniuses they need help. <laughs> That's all there is to it. <laughs> They're very confused. There is nothing more to it than that. It's very difficult to, to believe it, but I maintain that this is what's happening. I, I honestly cannot, because I've had those conversations before where, um, you know, people, because, you know, you, you, you push forth these arguments of, you know, arguments like Mary the Color Scientist and John Searle's um, The Chinese Room. And, that's a very different argument. That's a good one as well. Uh, yeah, it's a good one too. And um, and I've talked with people who actually then just, I think, I, I don't think it's a very principled move, but they'll turn and sort of bite the bullet of illusionism or eliminativism where they say, okay, well then, you know, experience doesn't exist. And yeah. that's, you know, in the sort of Daniel Dennett sense of it, I guess, at least in his earlier work, um, he kind of changed it to at least saying the hard problem is an illusion, not experience. But that uh, that is I, I don't even understand how you could possibly believe that yeah because, if you press yeah. them i have had the experience of uh, <laughs> actually interacting with people defending that point of view respectable mm. professors and all that yeah. and if you press them what you get is that what they mean by experience is not what 99.99 percent .99 of the world means by experience they have an overt implicit definition of the word experience which is the one that they are using so when they say experience is an illusion, what they mean by it is not what you think they mm. mean by it. And the rest of the world would think they mean by it. They mean something else. Uh, and then you say, oh, th then there may be something to their position then, because they mean something else. No, sure. there is nothing to their position, because this something else they mean uh, is utterly and completely 
and 100% mm -hmm. irrelevant to the hard problem of consciousness. In other words, if elimin 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 eliminativism <laughs> and illusionism um, are tenable because of this subtle covert redefinition of the term experience, then they are irrelevant to philosophy. Mm. On the other hand, if uh, eliminativism and illusionism are relevant to philosophy, then they are absurd. Mm. You, it, it's one or the other. Um, yeah. That's my conclusion. And it just, I, I, I don't understand how you could even believe that because it's, I mean, to deny, like that, that seems to be obviously the one thing that we can't possibly doubt for a second is that we have experience, right? Because you can, you can know what the experience of something is like before you know absolutely yeah, it, anything about the physical correlates of it. Yeah, it's nature's given. Yeah, but what they would yes. say is what you think your experience is, is an illusion. <laughs> that I'd... may be correct, but it's irrelevant as far as the heart problem is concerned. Mm -hmm. Because it if seems you say that that's an illusion, then you still have the heart problem. Because what mm -hmm. is meant by experience in the heart problem are raw phenomenal states. And mm -hmm. not what we think of uh, phenomenal states. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. It, it, they are either irrelevant or they are nonsensical. There, there, is, there is nowhere else. No, nowhere else they can fall. I tend to think they're nonsensical more than irrelevant. Like, I don't even know. A, I don't think there is a coherent uh, idea of what experience could be besides, you know, I mean, the, 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 the version put forth by Thomas Nagel, you used it earlier. What is it like to be something, right? Like, you know, presumably, it, it, I like the idea that he puts forth in his essay, what is it like to be a bat, about sort of trading places with different things, right? And how that experience would, would be different. Um, and I and I've had conversations with people who apparently and I don't know if this is like a dogmatic argumentative thing or if they really don't know what I'm talking about there. But, you know, deny that there is something that it's like to be even themselves. And I, and I, I quite frankly, can't even believe that. I just think that's <laughs> that, that's like, you know, Descartes said, you know, if there's one thing that we're sure of, it is that we have an experience. There's something that it's like to be me, even if we're wrong about the details of every single part of it. The one thing that we can't be mistaken about is that there is something that it's like to be me. The lights are on. I'm having an experience. Yeah, it's and, obvious. Yeah, and it's, you can't it's, doubt that. I don't understand how. Yeah. Yes, the thing exactly. is, uh, these guys uh, committed um, eliminativists and illusionists are not stupid. They're mm -hmm. very intelligent. And that's precisely the problem. Because when you combine high intelligence with fundamentalist commitments to a certain metaphysics, you find uh, let me put it positively, uh, amazingly creative ways to maintain the plausibility of that metaphysics you are already committed to. The human mind is, uh, uh, when it becomes invested in something, it's extraordinarily effective in finding ways to defend that something you're committed to, to preserve in it. Mm. Um, and, and this is what these guys are doing. They are highly intelligent, so they can come up with ridiculously tortuous ways of uh, um, postponing, confronting the obvious problem uh, in a way that sounds plausible to each other. Uh, not, not to the rest of the world, sure. but they sound plausible to each other, <laughs> yep. uh, in order to avoid having to confront the fact that the metaphysical position they are committed to is absurd. It's mm. completely nonsensical. They will find a way to deceive themselves into thinking that uh, there is still some room of plausibility uh, to, to not give up on materialism altogether. Mm. because they're very intelligent and, and that's the problem yeah so okay what about uh, the the final i think kind of the final concern that i wanted to bring up to you is um is I, I could imagine you know this question being raised then so in in your view of reality then how does empiricism make any sense if there's no um you know matter to be empirically examining well what we call matter uh, certainly exists uh, by calling it matter, we are defining what it is, and that's where we go wrong. But the yep. thing that motivates the use of the word matter, in other words, what appears on the screen of perception, obviously exists. Uh, we have perceptions that there is a world out there that we all inhabit, 
because you will describe that world in a way pretty consistent or at least mutually consistent with my description of the world I think to be living in. You will describe cars, trees, and buildings, and stars, and the moon, and I will describe them too. You will be experiencing them from a certain point of view, I mm. from another. Maybe our true experiences would be, may even be completely different. What you call blue may, may appear to you as something totally different than what I call blue. We can have inverted qualia, I don't know, but there is something out there that is grounding some level of consistency, that is maintaining a state independent of our inner state. Because when I mm. park my car in my garage and I go up to sleep, the next morning when I come back without having experienced my car for nine hours, uh, <laughs> guess what? It's still there. Still there yeah. so <laughs> something out there maintains the state of the world. Um, mm. I don't deny that. Uh, it's an empirical given too. What I deny is what we tell ourselves it is. When we tell ourselves it is something fundamentally outside and independent of mind as an ontological category, then I would say that's absurd. Now you're trying to replace reality with a description of reality and saying that reality itself arises from the description. But guess what? You need reality first in order to be able to describe it. So mm. that's where things go wrong. That's where you face the hard problem of consciousness. That's, why, that's where things become absurd. Uh, but there is something out there. And idealism doesn't deny that. Um, physics is going beyond what I would be um, ordinarily comfortable going. I go mm. there now because physics is pushing that direction. Physics is saying that that something out there isn't even physical. In other words, mm. even isn't even describable through a list of numbers. Um, it, it is multivalent. It's mm. more like th what you experience when you are in doubt about doing something. You have these mutually contradictory thoughts, possibilities of action, uh, they all coexist at the same time. What is out there is a superposition of probabilities. Uh, mm. It's not a world of objects with defined form, position, and speed, momentum. Um, so fine, uh, physics is pushing <laughs> me in that direction. So even physicality is not really out there. Physicality is a cocoon that uh, surrounds me uh, and which arises because of my act of measurement, my mm. act of interacting with the world. But if I were not here and nobody were here, there would be no physicality whatsoever. But there would still be something. Maybe it's not physical, but there obviously is something out there that holds the state of the world when nobody's measuring it. Something that ensures that we, uh, that our descriptions of our world are mutually consistent. And I would say that that's a thought. I'm using the word metaphorically because we define thoughts in terms of human thoughts and what I'm referring to isn't human, Sure. Uh, but uh, you can think of it as a, a universal thought, a uh, multi, multivalent thought, not only uh, uh, ambivalent, but multivalent. Um, mm. And physicality arises from uh, our observations of it, from our measurement uh, of it. But there is still something out there. I'm holding, I'm holding yeah. on to that because I think we cannot do away with it. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's a really important thing to sort of um, to clarify because it, I think that really absolves or at least helps absolve the, the, the accusation of sort of weird, spooky religious metaphysics or woo-woo to this, you know, that, that I, you know, personally, I've been accused of in talking about um, experience in in sort of non scientifically reductionist terms, which I think is totally legitimate to do. Yeah. Um, so we're just about to come up on uh, the one hour mark, um, and unfortunately, I have a hard stop. But uh, Bernardo, you've been extremely generous, and honestly, this has been one of the craziest and most enjoyable conversations I've had on this podcast. So thank you so much it's for been that. Fun. Thanks for having me. It was a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah, thank you. Um, before we close out, just um, if you could tell people uh, where they can find out more about your uh, your work. If they go to my website, bernardocastrup.com, Castrup, K-A-S-T-R-U-P, uh, everything is there. All my videos, books, essays, technical papers, theses, mm. <laughs> it's all in there. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, Bernardo, thank you so much again, and uh, take care. Thanks a lot. Take care, man. Well, I hope you found that podcast um, as entertaining and valuable as I did. Um, like I said at the introduction, I really, really enjoyed that conversation. If you want to find out more about Bernardo or his work, um, of course, I will leave uh, links in the description below. And if you want to support what I'm doing in this show, you can support me by going to patreon.com 
forward slash Jordan Myers. You can also help me in non-monetary ways by sharing this show on Twitter or on social media. You can rate the show on Apple Podcasts. You can like this video and subscribe on YouTube or on your RSS feed. You can discuss it on your own show. Or you can connect me with uh, guests or uh, recommend topics to cover. And you can do both of those things and more by contacting me at Plato's Cave Podcast at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore C underscore Myers. And of course, all the links for this will be in the description below. And of course, as always, thank you for listening and continue to keep struggling to escape the cave. Plato's Cave is produced by Muckraker Media. You can find out more at muckrakermedia.org.